Hello lovely kittens, in this video we're going to be looking at chemical changes for your Edexcel chemistry. This is a fantastic topic but there is a lot to pay attention to. If you want to make sure you don't miss anything, you can follow along with the free revision guide over on my website. On the pH scale, things that have a pH 1 are acidic, pH 7 is neutral and 14 is an alkaline. The ions responsible for acidity are hydrogen ions, the ions responsibility for alkalinity are hydroxide ions. The neutralisation equation is incredibly important, it comes up a lot and that tells us that hydrogen ions plus hydroxide ions can be neutralised to produce water. There are two indicators you can use for titrations. Phenolphthalein, which is the one you're seeing here, which in an alkali will be bright pink. And in an acid will be clear or colourless. Or methyl orange, which in an alkali you can see it's going this yellowy colour and in an acid will be bright red, giving us a neutralisation point where it is an orange colour. There is a big difference between strength and concentration. Strong acids are going to fully dissociate into hydrogen ions and other ions. The strong acids are hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid and chloric acid. I would expect you to know that hydrochloric acid is HCl, nitric acid is HNO3, and sulfuric acid is H2SO4. The other ones we don't have to worry about too much. Everything else is a weak acid, which means it only partially dissociates. Here we have strong and weak acids at high and low concentrations. So for our strong acid, we can see our hydroxide ions and our hydrogen ions are fully dissociated. They're not touching each other. They are separated. Here we have them at a high concentration, which means there are lots of hydroxide and hydrogen ions compared to very few water molecules. Here we have our strong acid, again, fully dissociated, but at a low concentration meaning there aren't very many um, hydrogen or hydroxide ions in a lot of water. For our weak acids, they are only partially dissociated, so some of the hydrogen and hydroxide ions have separated and some of them haven't, meaning that we are going to get some which are still together and some which are separated. At a high concentration, there are going to be lots of acid particles for a very few particles of water, whereas at a low concentration there aren't going to be very many um, acid molecules per molecule of water. You need to remember all of the equations, remember the ions, and be able to work out what is going to come from a reaction. So if we have an acid and a metal, we are going to get a salt plus hydrogen Acid metal oxide is going to give us a salt plus water. Acid metal hydroxide is going to be a salt plus water. Acid metal base, salt plus water. Acid plus metal carbonate is going to give us a salt, water and carbon dioxide. To work out the formula of the salts, you need to know the formula of all of your ions. Um, I've made flashcards to help you with this. Um, you can watch the video. I'm afraid you're going to need to watch it over and over again so that you learn it. And then you're going to need to make sure that you combine the ions in such a way that they are neutral overall. In an experiment, when you see bubbles coming off something, chances are it's going to be one of these four types of gases. Hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide or chlorine gas. To test for hydrogen gas, it is a squeaky pop. To test for oxygen gas, it is going to relight a glowing splint. Carbon dioxide turns lime water cloudy and chlorine gas is going to bleach damp 
litmus paper. For making a pure salt, we are going to be making sulf uh, copper sulfate. This is mixing sulfuric acid and copper oxide to make copper sulfate and water. You're going to need to heat the sulfuric acid, stir it in the copper oxide, which is a black powder, until it is in excess, which basically means you can't dissolve it anymore. Let it cool a bit, and then you can filter the solution to remove the excess copper oxide so that the black copper oxide powder will stay in the filter paper and then the solution of copper sulfate will come out down the bottom. Once you have your solution of copper sulfate, you can evaporate away the water to leave you with the copper sulfate crystals. Now this, the size of the crystals will depend on how quickly you do this, you're going to be left with blue crystals. The blue crystals here are the hydrated ones and the white crystals around the edge are the anhydrous ones. To carry out a titration, first of all you need to put 25 cm cubed in an alkali into a conical flask, add a phenolphthalein indicator or an indicator like methyl orange, fill a burette with an acid of a known concentration, take the initial reading on the burette and record it, and while swirling the flask, use the tap to slowly add, drop by drop, the acid into the alkali. When the first permanent colour change happens, pink to clear for phenolphthalein, stop adding the acid. Record the final volume in the yet and repeat titers until you get it within 0.05 cm cubed. When we are working out solubility rules, what is soluble, what is not soluble, it is really going to help if you know the formula of the ions and your salt equations. All nitrates are soluble. Most sulfates are soluble apart from lead sulfate, barium sulfate and calcium sulfate. Most halogen compounds, so most chlorides, bromides and iodides are soluble, except when they're combined with silver or lead. So for example, silver chloride, silver bromide, silver iodide are insoluble, lead chloride, lead bromide and lead iodide are insoluble. Sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate and ammonium carbonate are soluble. All other carbonates are insoluble. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide are soluble. All other hydroxides are insoluble. Here we have sodium chloride. Now ionic compounds have to be molten or dissolved to be able to conduct electricity. Because it's when it's in its solid state, you can see that this sodium and these chlorines are not going anywhere. They're very, very fixed. However, in a liquid or a molten or a dissolved state, when these ions are free to move around, that is when they're going to be conducting electricity, and that's when you can do electrolysis. The common setups for electrolysis that you need to know are sodium chloride, sodium sulfate, copper chloride, and copper sulfate. For sodium chloride, the products you are going to get are hydrogen gas, chlorine gas, and sodium hydroxide. For copper sodium sulfate, the products you're going to get are going to be hydrogen and oxygen gas. For copper chloride, you are going to get copper and chlorine gas. And for copper sulfate, you are going to get copper and oxygen gas. When we set up electrolysis, you need positive and negative electrode light bulb there just to check that electricity is flowing. You can see bubbles collecting around the positive and negative electrode. Sometimes this might be a metal collecting, as in the case of copper collecting here and here in copper sulfate and copper chloride. Um, you can test for all of the different gases coming off, for example, hydrogen, chlorine and oxygen. The test for hydrogen gas is a squeaky pop. The test for oxygen gas is relighting, glowing splint. And the test for chlorine gas is that it bleaches, damp, litmus paper. When you have a redox reaction, oxidation, 
is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. A good way to remember what the electrodes are called is that the positive electrode is the anode and negative is cathode. At each electrode in electrolysis we're going to have oxidation and reduction taking place and movement of electrons. And the half equations need to reflect this and they need to be balanced. The first thing we need to balance is the elements. In the first one we have um, copper and copper, one on each side, that's fine. But here we have two plus charge, we need to make a neutral charge. The only thing we can add in is electrons which have a negative charge because copper is two plus we need to add in two electrons. We are adding in electrons, this is gain of electrons, so this is reduction. And because copper is positive, it will go to the negative electrode, which is the cathode. The second one is a bit more complicated because you can see fluorine ion will go to a diatomic fluorine molecule. First thing we need to do is to balance the fluorines to go in there. Now we need to balance atoms, we have two negatives and it needs to go to a neutral. So we need to lose something, the only thing we can lose are electrons and to balance out the charges we need to lose two electrons. This is loss of electrons so it is oxidation. Fluorine is negative so it will go to the positive electrode. And the positive electrode is the anode.